For a couple of weeks now, we've mentioned that as air rises, it expands and cools. We are now finally going to study that process in more detail. Your textbook points out the following. One of the most significant facts in physical geography is that the only way in which a large mass of air can be cooled to the dew point temperature is by expansion as the air masses rise. This is important. Clouds generally form due to rising air. A bit later in the lesson we'll identify mechanisms that can cause the air to rise. But for now let's study the process of air expanding and cooling as it rises. So how do clouds form? Well, as air rises, the air expands and cools, and when it cools to the dew point temperature, condensation begins and clouds form. Adiabatic cooling and warming are the changes in air temperature that occur as the air rises and falls. Adiabatic cooling occurs when rising air expands due to the reduced pressure at higher altitudes, and as it expands, it cools. You have already likely experienced this concept. Have you ever let air out of a car tire? Please don't try this on my car. The air in the tire is under high pressure, and as it escapes to lower pressure, it's able to expand and it feels cool. We know that atmospheric pressure decreases with increasing altitude. Remember that from chapter 3 and chapter 5? Atmospheric pressure decreases as you get farther from the Earth. Thus, when an air mass is rising, it experiences less pressure as it rises, and it is able to expand outward. So why does it cool? Well, as air rises and expands outward, the molecules essentially spread out, and the work done by the molecules moving outward during this expansion reduces their average kinetic energy, and so the temperature decreases. The main thing to remember, though, is that as air rises, it expands and cools adiabatically. The reverse of this process is also true with adiabatic warming. As air descends, it contracts and becomes warmer. A similar but not entirely correct analogy would be to consider how hot the inflation needle gets when you are pumping up a basketball. You are forcing the air into a compressed state, and it is warming. So adiabatic warming is the warming that occurs by compression. When falling air compresses due to the greater pressure near the Earth's surface, it warms. As air descends and comes under increasing atmospheric pressure, the work done on the molecules by compression increases their average kinetic energy, so the temperature increases. It might be helpful to think about all those molecules getting jammed together, bouncing off one another, thus increasing their kinetic energy. In a nutshell, though, you can just remember as air descends, it contracts and warms adiabatically. Here's a diagram showing the same thing. As air rises, it's under less pressure and it expands. Over here, you can see the temperature that air started out warm, but as it rises, it gets cooler as it's expanding. Similarly, when the air is coming down, descending, it's under more and more pressure and it's contracting. And as it's coming down and contracting, the air warms. As stated earlier, this cooling that occurs as air rises is the most prominent mechanism for developing clouds and producing rain. As large air masses of air rise, they expand and are cooled, and eventually they may be cooled to the dew point temperature, at which point condensation begins and clouds form. So how fast does this cooling and warming occur? It depends. The rate of cooling depends on whether the air is unsaturated or saturated. Another way of saying that 
is that it, the, the rate depends on if the air is at 100% relative humidity or not. First, let's consider unsaturated air. When air is unsaturated, it cools at what's called the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Importantly, the air is not actually completely dry. It's just not saturated. The air is not at 100% relative humidity. So the dry adiabatic lapse rate is the rate at which an unsaturated parcel of air cools as it rises. And that rate is about 10 centimeters per thousand meters. So every thousand meters the air goes up in altitude, it loses 10 degrees Celsius of temperature. And notably, when the air comes back down again, it warms adiabatically at that same rate, 10 degrees Celsius for every thousand meters. You can see on this diagram that that dry adiabatic lapse rate, that, that cooling of air at 10 degrees Celsius for every thousand meters, doesn't continue indefinitely. Something happens. Eventually, as the air rises, expands, and cools, it eventually gets cool enough that it reaches the dew point temperature. Basically, the temperature goes down enough that as the relative humidity is going up, eventually the relative humidity hits 100%. We call that level the lifting condensation level. And at that point, at that temperature, at that elevation, condensation begins and clouds form. Sometimes we can see that exact altitude. In this case here, the air was rising and expanding and cooling. As it was, the temperature was going down, the relative humidity was going up, and at this level right here, the lifting condensation level, the temperature was cool enough that it was at the dew point temperature. Or another way of saying that is that relative humidity hit 100% and condensation started to form. And so now we have these vertically oriented clouds as the air is continuing to rise. At that point, when the air is now saturated, you can see it continues to cool as the air rises, but it doesn't cool as fast. Now it's only cooling about six degrees Celsius for every thousand meters. Why is this? Why does the rate change? Well, we know that as air rises, it expands and cools. And as it's cooling, as the temperature is going down, the relative humidity is going up. And if the relative humidity hits 100%, condensation starts to occur at the lifting condensation level and clouds form. We also know that condensation is a warming process. So now heat starts getting added to the system. Thus, as the air continues to rise, it still cools, but just not as fast. It cools at the saturated adiabatic lapse rate, which is less than the dry adiabatic lapse rate. This is important. I encourage you to rewind the video and work your way through that again, or at a minimum, talk it aloud to yourself so that you understand why there are two rates and why the SAR is less than the DAR. So we use the dry adiabatic lapse rate to calculate the temperature of rising air up until the air is at 100% relative humidity. And after that, we use the saturated adiabatic lapse rate to calculate the temperature of the rising air. You should be able to perform these calculations. As air rises, it drops in temperature 10 degrees for every thousand meters it rises up until the lifting condensation level where the air is saturated 100 percent relative humidity and after that it only drops six degrees for every thousand meters now what happens when the air gets to the top and falls back down over this mountain well as you can see from here we say that descending air always warms at that faster rate, at that dry adiabatic lapse rate. So it's warming 10 degrees 
for every thousand meters it goes down. Interestingly, that means on the other side of the mountain, it's warmer than it started on the first side of the mountain. So why does descending air always warm at the DAR? Well, the short answer is because descending air is always unsaturated. Think about it. As air descends, it warms. So as the temperature goes up, the relative humidity goes down. So the moment the temperature starts to go up even a little bit, the relative humidity goes down and it's no longer 100%. So descending air is always unsaturated and it always warms at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Interestingly, as this dry air warms as it goes down the mountain and eventually warms to a higher temperature than it started, this warm drying air can literally suck moisture right out of the landscape on the way down the mountain helping contribute to what we call the rain shadow effect. The rain shadow effect is an area of low rainfall on the leeward side of a mountain range or topographic barrier. For terms, we call this the windward side of the mountain and this the leeward side of the mountain. And the leeward side of the mountain tends to be drier and the windward side tends to be wetter. So we call this a rain shadow. There's no, not much rain, and it's very dry conditions over here in the shadow of the mountain. We have a great example of a rain shadow in the Sierras. Compare the west side of the Sierras with the dense pine forests to the east side of the Sierras, which is in Nevada and basically desert and scrubland. Or compare the windward side of Hawaii which happens to be the east side because they're in the trade winds, where Hilo is, which is basically a virtual rainforest, to the Kona side, which is basically a desert. This video clip on adiabatic cooling and warming introduced several new terms and concepts. I encourage you to pause the video and answer these questions in writing or at least orally you'll be glad you did.